And so the Sufi also makes knowledge, makes use of knowledge of the other people. And the people who matter when you're talking about the things that are unseen, what's going to happen after death, what's going to happen for an infinite time, the elapsing of time, that's in human time, not eternity, but human time, what's going to happen forever, is the people whom the creator of foreverness explained it to. And these are the prophets, alayhim salatu wasalam, upon whom be blessings and peace. Allah sent to them messengers, angelic messengers, and he revealed to them the tough questions, the things that are, are what a person is supposed to do and what a person is supposed to not do and what will be the consequences of it. And the prophets explained it to us. And the parts of their knowledge were, that were preserved down to us, they defined the external portions of the deen. The hadiths. I was told this morning, and I said, well, who am I talking to? And they said, well, most of them will be Muslims. And I said, okay, well, then we'll talk about Islamic things. And the hadiths, as you know, the traditions of the Prophet are, perhaps if we eliminate the repetitions, the hadiths that are rigorously authenticated as being of the Prophet's words, actually, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, probably 10,000 hadiths out of the 500 million or so hadiths or 700 million, probably up to a thousand with the repetitions of different hadiths of all sorts, uh, or a thousand million, or a thousand, a thousand, one million hadiths there probably are. But of these, the sahih is probably, I mean, it's probably around 10,000 hadiths. Now, my brother used to be a screenplay writer in Hollywood. And uh, to write a decent screenplay, you've got to produce about, you've got to knock out about 120 pages to be a decent uh, movie. And so 120 pages, you know, and it produces a movie that's, uh, I don't know how long a movie is these days, what is an hour and a half or two hours or something like that. If you take a lifetime of a person's, asp uh, of a person's uh, uh, endeavors and, and getting along in this world and you wrote it all down, you would have a lot of words written down if you wrote every single detail. You'd have considerably more than 10,000 hadiths. A hadith is just a little paragraph, after all, a little text. And so we have to, underst we have to understand that the Prophet said them everything that he said and everything he did was an exemplar to us as believers, as the followers of the Prophet. Oh, bless him and give him peace. And only a small part of it is written down and conveyed to us if you're objective. I know some people, uh, uh, the Bidah police, if there's any of them here today, will probably get angry if I say this. But the, uh, the, what we have from the Prophet them is a small fraction of what he actually did. For example, the khutbahs, the Friday talks that he gave at the Friday prayer. He gave, prayer, the, the, he gave khutbahs for 11 years, 500, or, you know, 52 khutbahs a year for 11 years. Not a single one of them is recorded. And so the hadiths, they preserve for us what? They preserve the outward aspects of the religion. What was the real message? What was the real the point? What was the, not the point, but the real message, the, the, the real uh, change that the Prophet brought? The change was in the men around him, the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala anhum, the people that he educated. If you want to make a tremendous amount of harm in the world, in the Islamic world or in the other world, just found a school and educate people and send them out. <laughs> They're all convinced the same way that, you know, what you want people to be convinced of. You can really have a tremendous effect, more so than books and more so than almost anything. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he had a school in Medina and he sent out people that really didn't care. <laughs> about anything except what he was teaching. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they went out from Medina and they never came back. Why? Because they died wherever they ended up. They spent their very life's blood for that which they believed in. which they, In other words, for literacy. To teach people how to read the universe and to understand what they were reading. I know. And so the external, and the, so the, the nur, the illumination, the light of the Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and this is what the Sahaba saw in him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They saw a man who was illumined, 
and they became illumined people. And when they went out, people saw that they, that they were illumined. And this is why they convinced people. They didn't convince people because of texts, but they convinced people because they had a context. I know. And the illumination was an illumination of action. It was an illumination of change. They became something after they weren't anything before. Omar ibn Khattab, one of the greatest of the Sahaba, if you ask an Orientalist, they'll say nobody had a greater effect on Islam of anybody after the Prophet ﷺ than Omar. He's a mujtahid, you know, it's someone who understood juridical reasoning and he used his understanding. You know. He used to make a, uh, you know, if you get a big pile of dates that are fresh, you know, freshly made into dates, and you can mash them together, and you could probably make a sculpture out of it if you were artistically minded. And Omar, radiallahu ta'ala, who said in the days of our, the period of ignorance, you know, before we knew anything, you know, the bad old days, the days that some of us look back on in our own lives and shake our heads. <laughs> he says, we used to make a statue, used to make a idol out of dates, and we worship it. He says, then, he says, well, what would happen if you got hungry? And he said, well, we'd eat them. <laughs> and so this is the basic, uh, and the message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent these people was that, you know, you're more than just producers and consumers. There's a secret in this universe that you don't really get, that you don't really understand. And so why not go beyond yourself a little bit? and learn how to understand that secret and become something different, become something that lasts forever. And so this is the path of Sufism. On Omar, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Omar, the same Omar who used to be make the statue and then ate it. <laughs> it's related from him, from his son, Ibn Abdullah, Abdullah ibn Omar, his son Abdullah, relates from Omar. He said, uh, And this is the basis for Sufism, the basis for understanding it. It's action that changes the heart. So this is what the Sufis used. They said, well, it's you and your arm. This is only the beginning. It's you and your arm doing something. You have to do something with your hand in order to change the heart. And this is what the, the prophets all brought, is ways of doing something. I mean, somebody who is master of every atom in the universe, is he concerned whether you get up in the morning and make your, make your fard salat, you know, wash your hands and wash your face, wash your feet and then pray to rakats for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the, in the dawn hours before any sane person is up? Does Allah need that? Allah doesn't need that. Rather, you need that in order to realize something. If you want to make something, you know, this is why the, anybody who's any good when they're teaching something around here or around any university, any professor who's any good, he makes, he makes his courses hard. His syllabus is longer than other people's. And you have to struggle in order to learn what he's got to offer. And one of the wisdoms in this is that when somebody has to struggle to learn something, they know the value of it. And so in the message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, sent, and someone who under, has to struggle in order to become literate, he knows the value of what, he's, what he learns how to do. And so there's taklif, or moral responsibility. Responsibility means answering in English, to respond to something, you know, respond to a question. And Arabic taklif means, kedlafa means to impose a burden on somebody. In other words, something he's supposed to do, and this is what we're so we're supposed to do. So Omar says, he says, while we were sitting with the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, just tell alayna rajulun shadeed al-bayad al-tiyab shadeed al-suwad al-sha'ar. Suddenly a man came, and of, with jet black hair and of snow white gar garments, snow white raiment, لا يرى عليه أثر السفر ولا يعرف منه أحد. The there was no trace of he was uh, of jet black hair and snow white garments. Snow white garments were not a common thing in an age before soap was invented, which is what the Sahaba lived in in Medina. They used a shnan, a herbal business that they rubbed the clothes and then rinsed them out 
wasn't any soap. Snow white garments and jet black hair. There wasn't a trace of traveling upon him, but none of us knew him. The mysterious stranger. In other words, a one-horse town like Medina, in, which, in the summertime, when all the d dirt roads, you know, the people treading on them and walking on them, they raise dust when you travel. And when you raise dust, you get it on your clothes. And so he says there was no trace of having traveled upon him. But yet, he, so he wasn't from out of town. But none of us knew him. And it's a one-horse town. You know, all the house, all the towns were one-horse towns in those days, except very few. Everybody knows everybody. If somebody does something new, everybody knows it. <laughs> knows everybody else's business. And yet none of us knew him. So he wasn't from out of town, and he wasn't from in town either. Hatta the jealous of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the mysterious stranger, until he sat in front of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. فَأَسْنَ لَرُكْبَتَيْهِ لَرُكْبَتَيْهِ وَوَضَعَ كَفَيْهِ عَلَى فَخَذَيْهِ And so he put his knees up to his knees. And he put his hands on his uh, on his thighs. Qal ya Muhammad. He said, "Oh Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam." Akhbirun yana al-Islam. He says, "Tell me about Islam. What is it?" Qal Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He said, "The Prophet, Allah bless him and give him peace." He said. Islam and Tashar and La ilaha illallah. This is one question that uh, the reason I'm telling it is because it can benefit us today. He says, Well, what is Islam? What is submission? What is the context in which the, so the person is either uh, submits to the powers that be or the power that is? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't submit. So he said, What is Islam? The word means submission. What is it that we're supposed to do outwardly? He said, "And tashhad an la ilaha illallah, one the Muhammad and Rasulullah." He says to uh, testify, to attest that there is no god but God, and that the uh, that Muhammad is the messenger of God. One to qim salat, wa to attend zakat, wa to sum Ramadan, one to hajj al bayt and istitata ilay sabila, and to uh, establish the prayer, that which wakes us out of our heedlessness five times a day. And to give zakat, which is not charity that you're uh, bountifully bestowing on the, uh, the the grunts and the people that are poor and that you can feel better than because by giving to them, zakat is their money that you're bringing out of your wealth. They already own it. The poor already own that a portion of your money by the mere fact of a year having elapsed upon it. So you're giving them what's theirs. Why? Because they don't have the means to work and they're poor, and they're hungry. If the Muslims all gave 2.5% of their wealth, all the Muslims that are on the face of the earth today, there wouldn't be any poor people. <laughs> and it's already theirs. It's not like they're bountifully, you know, out of the largesse we're giving them, because they already own it. So, so giving zakat, and the word zakat, what does it mean? It means purification. Purification of what? Purification of our heart, which is so dirty that it thinks that people don't have any rights over us. That we're number one, and that everything that we give other people is to just of our pure uh, beneficence. And so we're giving them what's theirs, and this purifies the heart. It's a way of purifying the heart. Psalm of Ramadan and fasting of Ramadan, which is again existential. No one understands its meaning except someone who does it. One to Hajjul, uh, one to Hajjul Bayt, and to make pilgrimage to the sacred house if you are able to, i.e., financially and otherwise able to. Qala Sadaqt. And the visitor, the mysterious stranger, he said, You've told the truth. Fajibna lahu. Yasalahu we sadaqahu. So we were surprised, we're shocked at him. He asked the question and he said, You're right. Who does he think he is? Qal <laughs> and he said, Fakhbirni an an Iman. He said, Tell me about Iman, what is faith? قال أن تؤمن بالله وملائكته ورسله وكتبه ورسله ويوم الآخر وأن تؤمن بالقدر خيره وشره. He said it's to believe in Allah and His books and His messenger and His books and His angels and His messengers and to believe in the last day and to believe in destiny. 
it's good and it's evil. That's why Imam Muslim related this hadith in his Sahih. It's related in Bab al-Qadr, in the, uh, the chapter about destiny. That's the point of uh, mentioning the hadith in this chapter. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He owns every atom in the universe, and He is aware everything is already present for Him now. Eternity that He uh, knows is different than the time that we experience, the two opposites. Allah, Daimu Mia, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To believe in all of these things. And so, in other words, well, what am I supposed to do? If you arrive at a job, you know, and you want to find out, well, what's the job description? You know, you got to find out what you're supposed to be doing. So he told, we're supposed to, we said, we render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, and unto, unto God the things that are God's. Well, that what is Allah's? Everything. Your outward being, in other words, your time, your actions, and your mind also. We we have to worship Allah with everything that we've got. And what is it that you've got? You've got a body, and that's obvious to everybody, friend and foe. Lots of people might hate the sight of you. <laughs> They're your enemy. Your mind... Which we, with which we think and conceive and reason. And we have to worship Allah with that also. And the worship of the mind is that we believe in Him and that we believe in the unseen. Just as, And it's not an unreasonable thing. Well, how can we believe in something that we... I've already listed off 50 million examples of things that you already believe in without your knowing why exactly, except by convention. We believe that this building won't collapse on me. We believe that... You know, the stuff that we buy is, you know, you know it's what it appears to be. To, we exploit thousands of areas of, un, of knowledge that is unknown to us by the knowledge of others. And so when Allah sends a messenger to us and says, Beware, beware, I am to you but a naked warner, which is what they used to do if somebody wanted to make a splash in the pre-Islamic times. And they, you know, and they wanted to make an announcement in town that nobody would forget and everybody would listen to. If he saw an army on the way there to destroy the town, he would take off all his clothes and run into town. And he would say, "Beware, beware! There's an army on the way." And this made his probably made as much of a splash in their time as it would in ours. <laughs> so people listened. And so the prophet said, "This is this is the way I am in relation to all of you." I'm a naked warner. It became a, a parable or a, a semblance or a figure of speech, I should say, in the, in the Arabic language. A naked warner, somebody who had something to say that was important and that everybody had to listen to. He says, this is the way I am. And so what's he warning about? These, these very things, that we've got to take care of this or things will go hard. You know. قال فأخبرني عن الإحسان and the mysterious stranger, he says, well, he says, tell me about uh, excellence, spiritual excellence. And he said, فقال أن تعبر الله كأنك تراه فإن لم تكن تراه فإنه يراك And this is Sufism. And this is the de prophetic definition. And this is the whole matter to, uh, relates to this precisely. He, said it, he says it is to worship Allah as though you see him. And if you see him not, yet he sees you. And at the end of the hadith, which most, every Muslim is familiar with, it's a very famous hadith. He says, ثم من تلق Omar رضي الله عنه He says, then he left. Mysterious stranger left. He says, so I waited a long time. I didn't say anything. فقال, and then the Prophet, he said, يا عمر, أتدري من السائل? He says, oh, Umar, do you know who the questioner was? فقلت, الله he said, Allah and his messenger know best. قال, جبريل, أتاكم, he says, it is Gabriel. He came to you in order to teach you your religion. Words, he knew the answers all along. <laughs> but he came to you, he came to here in order that everyone else should hear this and should benefit from this. He came to you to teach you your deen, which is the word for religion in the Islamic context and in the Arabic, in the parlance. 
And so the Deen, is, which is, uh, it comes from the word, or it's related to the word Dain, which means the uh, debt or obligation that which was, by which we're bound to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we'll have to answer to him, is uh, th these three matters. It relates to all of these three matters. To do these things with our body, which is Islam, and to believe these things with our minds, which is Iman, or faith, leap of faith, and Ihsan, or spiritual excellence, which means to worship Allah as though you see Him. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an infinitude that is aspatial and atemporal. Why? Because He's a pure exteriority to all of our phenomenal categories. Any category, cognitive category, but by which phenomena arise is Allah is beyond that entirely. He's more than that. We say Allahu Akbar, meaning that Allah is greater than that. And so how can we see him? Because everything that arises as a phenomenon for the eyes, certainly, it's got to be so tall and so wide and you know, has to look like something. In other words, it has to be, an, you know, it has to be to fit into the analogical intellect with an analogy with everything else that we've ever seen. And so how can we see Allah? And the answer is that we can see Allah by a faculty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created within the human soul. Basr, which is eyesight, is that which sees phenomenal reality. And basira, or insight, is that which beholds Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and beholds the divine. And so Sufism is the project and the progresses and the knowledge, for it is not opinion, it's knowledge. And anybody who does it and fulfills its conditions and travels the path, their basira opens up and they behold Allah with their basira, not with eyesight, which is impossible because of the nature of the divine, but with basira, with his faculty. Uh, for the sake of which Allah has created your soul. In other words, one knows the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One sees Allah's beginningless and endless beauty, which is commensurate with his entity and with his being, as all his attributes are. They're commensurate with his entity. And, you know, everything that we like, you know, why is it that people like Sufism, after all? Everything that we like, you know, whether it's this sweater, you know, it was a relief to put on this sweater over my shoulders after I was cold because I got warm again. Didn't suffer from the cold anymore. If you've got someone who envies you and never lets you rest, except that he always sends something your way that will mess you up in the eyes of other people or in yourself. In other words, he's trying to de earnestly wants to destroy you. If you suddenly he goes out of his house one day and he gets run over by a truck. You know, there's a tremendous relief <laughs> in Allah having eliminated one of your enemies. And anybody who's had a, lived a bit in their life you know, has had a few enemies. <laughs> you know, and so th this is something that, you know, it may be in relation to him, you know, it, it's, uh, it may be indifferent or it may be, <laughs> you know, everybody's a good guy after they're dead. But in relation to you, it's a big relief. And similarly, when you're out in the elements, you know, it's raining down on you, and uh, it's ice cold, and your hands are just so cold that they're blue. And you find the, you know, it's like the wind's blowing, and it's 20 below zero. And uh, you finally come to a place, and you pull up in your car, and you get inside a, a concrete garage, or a wooden garage in this country. And there's some break from the windshield, and so the temperature goes up. You get out of your car, and it's, a, and it's a, or you, you get out of the wind. It's better, and it's a tremendous relief because you've got a, some protection from the elements. And you open up the door off the garage, and you go into the house, and it's a real relief. You know, you're out of the rain, and you're out of the cold, and there's a moment of beauty there. But it doesn't last too long. And the same thing is when you're starved. You come home and you say, I'm starving, put the food on the table. <laughs> Your wife, or whoever the cook is on that day. And you say, put it on the table, I can't stand it no more. So you fall on the food and you eat it up, and there's a moment of beauty there because you're relieved from your hunger. 
and all of these things and in everything that we do or the, all of these are relief from something negative but also the attainment of something positive whether it's money you know someone hands you a suitcase full of five million dollars whatever it is you know it says it's all yours so well I can think of a few things that I'd like to do with five million dollars most of us can <laughs> now, this is a moment that is beautiful in itself but it passes away everything in which beauty inheres is conditioned by the object of it in which it inheres because beauty is only an attribute of these objects in our phenomenal world the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not limited by the object <laughs> that, it quali that it qualifies because it doesn't qualify it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's coextensive with his being and that's why he who attains to the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who knows it and this is what, what is beauty except the knowledge of that beauty of being able to appreciate it and being present at it and the perfection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the this is why the this basira and ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tarahu to worship Allah so you see him one knows directly and experientially and this is the effect and this is the point and this is the purpose this is why the Sufis have tired themselves out so much trying to attain it it's like someone who wants to become literate has to take some pains to do so also is that the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the oneness and uniqueness and aloneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is coextensive with his beauty who, who reaches that reaches a sea of the beginningless, endless perfection and beauty of Allah, mighty and majestic. And so, unlike, you know, the marble shower that you've bought and installed in your house, that the beauty of it fades after three days, <laughs> the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't fade. It's absolute perfection, and it's absolute beauty, and it's absolute goodness. And the only reason that we love anybody is for usually for one of these three things, either he's, or he or she, it has a perfection and so we like them a great deal because they have a particular perfection you admire them and you want to be around them and you love them for that perfection or you love them because they're beautiful or good looking you know wow and so you're in love with them because of that or you or you like them or you love them because they're kind to you and they have some benefit to you and they've done a lot for you and they're doing a lot for you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the person who reaches the sea of Tawheed, a sea that doesn't have any shores, he realized that, realizes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is the author of all the beauty and the author of all the perfection. And he's the author of every benefit that we enjoy. There's nothing that can benefit us in reality or, in reality or harm us besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this is the secret of the ibadah of the Sufis. They worship him out of the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They worship him out of the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in reality, his love, if we look at it from the point of view of Tawheed, the real sincere love, the most sincere love that you'll ever have for any human being in this world is probably your love for yourself. <laughs> so that's something you're not chilled out on him usually. You know, you're usually able to put up with quite a bit before you get mad at yourself. <laughs> so it's a very sincere love. And in Sheikh Ibn Arabi, radiallahu anhu, the Sheikh al-Akbar, he says that the most sincere love, absolutely, in an absolute sense, is the love of Allah for, him own, for his own self, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the reason that the Sufis love Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that he created us in order to love him out of his love for himself, the perfect and infinite love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they say, well, that's kind of selfish. How come he doesn't think of anybody else? Because there isn't anybody else. <laughs> subhanahu wa ta'ala. I know. And so this is basically what Sufism is. 